there is nothing more satisfying than a fine day of sales. Haggling with the customers and ripping them off with overpriced goods. Ah, capitalism at its finest. If you were like me, Reseteer and Item's Tale was the first game that introduced the world of the shopkeeping genre. There was something really intriguing about running your shop from the ground up, starting with basically nothing but just a small cozy store, and turning it into a multi-million dollar franchise. Well, not really a multi-million dollar franchise, but, but you could get there if you really tried and grinded a lot, but that's not the point here. The game's mechanic were really on point, and even the dungeon crawling aspect of it was at times repetitive, but addictive. The anime type graphics was also a huge plus for me, as I am a huge fan of anime. Also, the game wasn't too stressful, as you could decide to play it at your own pace, as game overs weren't really true game overs, as you would restart the loop but maintain all your levels and items, making it much easier to progress. And, after you finish the game once, you could readjust the difficulty beforehand, if you wanted a more lax playthrough, or wanted a challenge. If you were a sadist, you would opt for the most hardest difficulty, trying to min-max each day and squeeze out every single penny that you could. As much as I like a challenge, I opted for a more serene and peaceful route for this video's playthrough. We are put in the shoes of Receipt, a clumsy yet kind-hearted girl that unfortunately inherited a father's death, as he has gone missing playing hooky to being a hero. Receipt, having no money to her name, is helped by quote-unquote a loan shark fairy, Tear, to set up an item shop in order to pay off her father's debt. Henceforth, the name of the shop, Receipteer, the names both combine together. Receiving guidance and help from Tear, your literal fairy, you have to scrounge together a growing weekly lump of money in order to pay back the loan. You start off each day in the shop and are allocated four periods of time to do what you want. The game's protagonist referred to these blocks of times as slices, as Receipt really can't stop thinking about food and sweets. Therefore, slices of pie being referred to the time you have for each day. Each action that you do will take a certain amount of time to fulfill, whether it be shopping for goods in town, exploring or heading to the dungeon. You have full control of what you want to do for that particular day, but it's always good to plan in advance as you need to use the slices of time to run your shop as well. Managing and organizing your time is quite important if you want to make the most of the day, as how you start off the day will pretty much determine what you're going to do for its remainder. So, let's break it down a little, shall we? I like to think there are three main hubs in the game. First, the store. Second, the town. And lastly, the dungeon. The shop is basically the main core aspect of the game, as everything pretty much revolves around it. Opening your store takes one slice of time, so preparing in advance before opening is important. Customers will come into your shop once the store is open and select items from the counters to buy. Here, you haggle with the customers to sell the goods at an increased price. The percentage you increase really depends on the customer as some of them don't have a bigger budget than others. For example, this little girl is um, a little girl, so you know she doesn't have any money. So it's always safe to go with minuscule increases with her. It's also important to note that the more you haggle with the customer or if the price isn't right for them, they won't really like you. If you call a price that is just right or cheaper than what they initially think, they'll like you more. This will increase their heart levels with you, allowing you to haggle with them more, and this also increases their maximum budget, a secret mechanic that isn't visually shown. I like to think there are three groups of people that come visit your shop. First are normal groups of NPCs. These are the normal villagers, the main bulk of your customers, like the old man, the young man, the woman, and the girl. Second are character plot NPCs, such as your rival and a fairy, the con artist Yuria, the guild master. These characters are a little more unique in design and also have their own gimmick, like Alue, your so-called rival, having unlimited funds and being able to pay more than the base price higher than the other customers. The last group of customers are your adventurers, the people that you take with you to go exploring the dungeons. The adventurers initially don't have a lot of money, so you can't really increase the prices too much, However, when the adventurer buys equipment they can use, they will permanently equip that item so you're incentivized to sell the goods at a lower cost. There's a total of 8 different adventurers that you can hire to help you do dungeon runs, but I will go into the individual details of them a little later in the video. There are a lot of things that you can do in the store besides just sitting at the counter and selling products. In the store, you are able to place down items that you want to sell on the counters provided. Where and what you place is also quite important. The counters near the windows are showcase counters. The items that are placed here are more likely to be sold and depending on that item type, customers will tend to ask of that type more when requesting specific items. Throughout the day, you'll get random announcements, letting you know what type of items are increasing or decreasing in price. Sometimes there'll be special announcements that an item is trending or booming. 
If you had that said trending item on the window counters, you'll have a sudden flock of customers all looking for that item, which I might say is really good for business. After a little while of playing store keep, you'll eventually increase in merchant levels, allowing different types of upgrades to be carried out. Gaining a higher level, customers will be able to sell you goods at a cheaper cost than what you would normally buy from when going out shopping. Naturally, you'll also be able to haggle your way to gain the cheapest product possible. Customers will also order items for a set later date. For example, X amount of blank items two or three days later. This allows you to sell specific items in bulk for a good amount of profit. Other benefits of leveling up include being able to expand your store into a bigger place, redecorate, gain more inventory when dungeon exploring, and so on. You can also get an vending machine that allows customers to buy from there when you're too busy to serve them, which results in more sales per day. But the products sold in the vending machine cannot be haggled and have to be bought for base price. This is good strategically if you want to get rid of lower costing items or items that are not hot on the market right now. With enough levels, you can also redecorate furniture, walls, and carpets to get certain type of ambiences. So depending on your decor and items that are placed on the counters, you attain a certain store atmosphere. Depending on the atmosphere, you attract different type of customers. The mechanics are a little bit more complex than that, but that's what it is pretty much in a nutshell. Next up, we have the town. The town is where you will frequent a lot to for some story beats here and there, and also to buy some equipment and go shopping. There are seven main points of interest in the town map, so let's go through them one by one, shall we? First is Reseteer, the point of exit from your shop. Here is, uh, well, your store, pretty much self-explanatory. If you don't leave anywhere and return right away, you take no slice of time away from your precious working hours. If you do plan to leave to any of the locations, it'll take one slice of your day. For instance, the Merchant's Guild, a very important location as it has many functionalities. Initially, it serves as an information hub as most of your gameplay questions can be asked to the Guild Master. He also sells very important weapons and gear for your adventurers. The weapons and armor are sold at a cheaper price than the base price, so you can buy and resell it at the store for a profit. The higher level you are in merchant levels, the better and broader his wares get. You also unlock the option to fuse ingredients and equipment together to get unique and rare gear later on as well. Another point of interest is the market. The market sells items different from the merchant's guild, as this place mainly specializes in accessories, books, food, vitamins, and decor items for your store. Likewise with the merchant's guild, you can gain access to more items the more you level up, and all things can be sold for a profit if bought and resold. The town square, the pub, and the chapel are mostly used for story beats, as you can run into adventures here and there, but besides that, it really isn't used for much else. I saved the most important for last, which is the adventurer's guild. Here you will choose one of the 8 adventurers, optimize your loadout and gear, decide how much food to take and where to explore. Each adventurer has a different cost depending on their level and relationship with you, but the first explorer you unlock goes for free even when you're broke. The adventurer's guild ties in with the last of the hubs, which is the dungeon. After all the prep, exploring a dungeon will pretty much take the whole day, sometimes 2-3 to three slices, and if you explore a lot, by the time you come back, it's already sleepy time. Dungeons at first are quite difficult, as there are respawning enemies and booby traps. Trying to explore every nook and cranny for treasure without being thoroughly prepared might cause serious damage to your bank, as you will not only lose the gear and items you brought and picked up on the way, but pretty much everything else except one item. Yes, if you fail a dungeon run, you're only allowed to take back home just one item, so you better make sure it's one hell of a valuable item. There are 6 different dungeons in total, each consisting of certain amount of floors that are reset and randomized every time you go in. But most of the dungeons have a boss level every 5 or 10 floors and also containing rare treasure at the end. You're also given the option to leave the dungeon and escape with your hard earned loot every 5 floors. But as they say, if you want to risk it for the biscuit, you can keep on adventuring till the end. You might run out of inventory space by then, but hey, get rid of the cheap items for better ones, right? It goes without saying that with each newer dungeon you unlock, the harder it becomes, and the more unique the drops and loot you'll be able to get. Now, if you want to go adventuring, you need the help of the adventurers. The first adventurer you obtain is Louis. He serves as your basic swordsman, able to equip swords and shields. He's an upcoming adventurer that is broke, as he just started his career. Since he is the very first adventurer you can use, he never requires more money than you have. So basically, you can go adventuring with him even if you don't have any money left. He's the only adventurer that will go with you, free of charge, if you're broke, as I'm sure that he knows that feeling all too well. As he is the first hero you unlock, his stats are well-rounded and balanced. 
He has no real weaknesses as he has a high health pool and boasts a high defense stat as well. Equipping him with powerful swords quickly is a must as his natural strength lacks the oomph that you need to take out enemies. Eventually, with proper gear, Lu will be strong enough to take out enemies with ease. He has a wide arc when he swings his sword and is able to block projectiles with his shield. His skills are nothing too special as he just swings his sword in a circular motion or is able to shoot out sword blasts. Compared to the other characters, Lui don't really have much skill points, but his skills are relatively low cost, costing only 5 SP. But still, you're only able to cast a few skills before you must only rely on your sword swings, so it's always good to top up on some food that recover SP. Lui has an average movement speed and isn't able to dash, so he isn't the ideal character to speedrun or to take on longer dungeon runs. But what he lacks in mobility, he makes up for in survivability. Charm is the second character that you unlock. At first, she is a boss that you have to face against at the end of a dungeon run. After beating her, if your shop is dark and gaudy, she will appear in your shop where she will frequent the shop and also give you her adventurer card to join your party. Charm is of the thief class, able to move swiftly and strike true with her daggers. She is one of the fastest characters in the game, able to sprint, dash, parry attacks and has a quick animation when attacking. Thematically, being fast also means that you lack stats in the defense department and this is true with Charm. Since she is a thief, she is able to detect traps in treasure chests as well. Charm has a decent skill pull point and is able to cast skills with a little leisure before needing to replenish her SP. She is able to create up to 5 mirror images that will inflict damage independently of each other. She is also able to use a spell called Flame Charge where she charges forward with fire that has pretty decent coverage of AoE. It doesn't really do much damage and is more useful as an escape tool when she is in a pinch or for mobility. Her last skill is Shadow Weave, where she throws down a sticky net on the ground where it slows down enemies. Charm is a little bit more trickier to use than Lui, so it's preferred that she is geared up properly before adventuring. Kei Lu is the third adventurer you unlock. He's the magician of the party. He is very smart but quite arrogant, as he refuses to believe Receipt is the owner of the shop and thinks that Tyr is the real owner. Being a spellcaster, Kei Lu has the lowest health pull but has the highest SP out of all the characters. He also has a weak primary attack and slow movement speed, uh, but his true strength comes from attacking from afar, safe in the distance where he can spam his spells. Kalu has two primary attacks. Firstly, he can swing his staff around like a normal melee attack, or charge his attack for a ranged attack. This is, however, risky, as he has to get a little more up and personal, and although it does recharge 10% of his SP, it is more reliable to consume SP recharging items instead. Kelu's real potential comes in the form of his powerful elemental spells. Pyrobomb is his first skill, a fire explosion that does AoE damage, useful for crowds of enemies. Ice Mine, an ice spell that damages enemies that come near it, uh, this spell is a little difficult to use as getting the positioning right takes on practice. Spark Burst is a continuous barrage of arcane missiles that damages the enemies in a V-cone area in front of them. Gemini Force, a spell that summons shields that orbit around Kalu, damaging enemies that come near him. And lastly, the Warp Spell, a spell that teleports him randomly while dungeon crawling. Its true usefulness comes when boss fighting, as it floats Kalu in the air, giving him at least 2 seconds of invincibility. With all these spells, Kalu is a powerful glass cannon. Fourth on the list is Ethan, a black belt order monk slash priest in training. Ethan is a very passionate man for the children in the orphanage, but infamous for piling up huge tabs at the pub. Ethan is a hand-to-hand -hand specialist using gloves as his main weapon. Like Louis, he is a very beefy tanker, having the highest HP but a very low SP pull. Ethan has a high attack and also good defense, but because he has to get upfront and personal with every encounter due to his low attack range, he tends to get hit more than often compared to Louis. Ethan is like a faster version of Louis as his movement speed is a little more quicker and he is able to dash. He also lacks a lot in his SP pull, once again, similar to Louis. Uh, writing the script, I realized I compared the two a lot together. Anyways, he has a lot of powerful skills he can use but can't use them too regularly and should be only used when you really need to. His first skill is the same spell that Charm has, the Flame Charge ability. Unlike Charm, however, Ethan's version requires a little bit more of a cast time and is a little slow. The damage is also comparatively weaker and should be only used for mobility or getting out of sticky situations. Fist Fury is referred to being similar to Street Fighter's Akuma's Raging Demon as he phases forward towards an enemy and deals a barrage of combos for a burst of damage. 
Berserk is his last skill, a powerful skill that buffs his attack and defense. During this time, Ethan can't be knocked down but also gains a debuff that doesn't allow him to use other skills or items. TL is another character that you must first encounter as a boss fight before able to hire as an adventurer. Stereotypically as elves are usually portrayed, TL is the archer class you are able to use. She is high offense, low defense character similar to Kailu. She is another glass cannon character that can use a bow and arrows to take out enemies from afar. She is able to charge her attacks shooting multiple arrows and an arc in front of her. Not only that, she is able to charge her attacks while moving as well. So shooting a charged attacks at point blank range is more manageable since you can move closely towards the target. When you do so, she will unload all her arrows to the enemy for massive damage. Perfect for sniping out bosses quickly. She is able to have 5 levels of charge, each charge progressively increasing the damage in the amount of arrows being shot. The level 5 charge allows you to shoot 5 arrows in front of you, 3 arrows behind you at 125% damage. As if this was not enough, her skills are no laughing matter as well. Firstly, she is able to shoot a flaming arrow that pierces all enemies in a straight path. Second, Seeker Arrow, an arrow that is basically a homing projectile that hits 3 times. Third, Starshot Arrow, where a rain of arrows lock on and hit enemies a couple of times. And finally, Cute Rage, a buff that paralyzes nearby enemies except bosses and allows TL to charge a bow 4 times faster, and allows it to charge past level 5 charge to level 6 charge. Besides Louis, TL is probably my other favorite character to use for dungeon runs. Nagi is an adventurer that you randomly come across while exploring the dungeons. After encountering her 4 times, she'll start appearing in your store. Nagi is the lancer of the group, having the longest melee range out of all the characters. Her movement and speed are pretty decent, but she lacks the arc in her primary attack swings, so her attacks have to be somewhat precise. Like Louis, she can block projectiles and also equip shields. She is also able to run and charge with her spear, damaging monsters in front of her. Nagi personally feels the most rounded as she has well balanced stats and is quite safe to play with. She also has a decent SP pull to spam her abilities as well. Similar to some of the other characters, she has the flame charge spell for mobility. Her second ability is the 100 thrusts, where she attacks all enemies in front of her, hitting them several times. Once cast, she cannot cancel it or move, so it is important to get her in a position where she cannot be flanked. Spin Slash is another ability similar to Louie as it is Nagi's ability to deal AoE damage. And her last ability, Vacuum Spear, is another similar ability where she shoots a projectile forward. Griff is also another boss adventurer. Once again, you must beat him in the Obsidian Tower dungeon before you can recruit him. He prefers to visit your store during the darker hours and if the atmosphere is dark as well. Griff is the assassin class and uses claws as his weapon of choice. He has well balanced stats and is quick and also has a decent arc to his primary attack as well. Having a high SP pull, he is able to use powerful skills. Dark Claw is Griff's version of Flame Charge, leaping forward and damaging enemies. Demon Soul buffs all Griff's stats and almost doubles his attack speed. Similar to Ethan's Berserk, Griff can't use any other skills or items at this time. Griff's last spell is Vampire Vortex, where he'll shoot out a vortex that siphons in enemies into it and drain their HP. Arma is the last adventurer that you can get. She also serves as a boss fight as well. She is a golem designed to control the dungeons. Arma is basically the ultimate last boss fight out of all the adventurers. And her stats are overall well balanced and there is nothing too special to mention. She is however a very unique adventurer to use as her attacks and playstyle changes depending on what weapon part you equip on, which consumes ammo every time you attack. So let's go through them one by one shall we? Punch unit, a basic punch attack. Hammer arm, a revolving orb that collides with enemies for damage. Disc unit, a circular sword that shoots out and boomerangs back. Flamethrower, basically what the name implies, uh, a flamethrower. Gatling unit, a gatling gun that shoots several projectiles in quick succession. Null parts, basically a shotgun. Drill arm, armor becomes stationary and uses the drill to damage enemies in front. Gumball unit, similar to null parts, a shotgun that shoots out gumballs in an arc. Crisis cannon, a railgun that shoots a laser with a delay. Messiah unit, a grenade launcher. Gravity cannon, similar to crisis cannon but different color. Chaos unit, a sphere of energy that damages enemies. 
Fanlex Cannon, a strong version of the Gatling Gun. Pandora Unit randomizes all the previously mentioned weapons, sometimes backfires causing traps to occur. And lastly, Omega Cannon, several lasers that hold on to enemies. Armor's only skill is the Vector Cannon, a skill that uses all your SP and takes 5 seconds to cast. Once cast, it does devastating damage to almost everything on the screen. As Amra is the most unique out of all the characters, she is the hardest to unlock as well, as you have to finish the game once, play in endless mode, and unlock all the previous characters before you're able to unlock her. But since she is a unique character with an interesting mechanic, she is definitely worth the trouble. So, there we have it, all the aspects of Reseteer Explode. I may have omitted out some details here and there, but there will be a day-by-day -day playthrough coming shortly as well. So if you want to see some more Resetia content, please make sure to subscribe and keep notified. Also, let me know in the comments below if you have played this game before, or if there is any other old indie content you'd like to see. This has been Recream of the Indie Masters. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah.